who hears what. He doesn't answer any questions, and he doesn't even explain the problem of the scribes and Pharisees in detail to the scribes and Pharisees. And today the Lord Jesus is gathering us around in his house, and he is telling us something. It's not for the whole world. He tells them some things too. But this morning the message is not for everybody out there, brothers and sisters. The message is not for everyone we think should be hearing the sermon this morning. The message is not even for the scribes and Pharisees, or Mark would not have included it. We love these sermons up here. We love these sermons because they seem to let us off the hook. They're like the preacher who is consistently preaching about liberalism, progressivism, modernism, abortion, homosexuality, transgenderism, and we never deal with the in-house issues. And it's hard to believe they make a living doing it. So verse 17 He says in verse 18, rather to his disciples, he said to them, are you thus without understanding? The disciples asked him about the parable. And Jesus says at the end of verse 18, uh, verse 18, are you thus without understanding? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him? Now, all right. All right, let's work through this together, church. When Jesus says, are you yet without understanding? What's another way of saying that 2017 language? Are you stupid? You've hung out with me for two and a half years and you're this daft? All right, good. Good help. He says, do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him? He's he's not talking about eating per se. Remember, this is not a sermon against washing your hands and it's not a dietary sermon. Certainly we know that if you eat the wrong thing, it may very well cause some gastrointestinal turmoil. No? I've heard some testimonies before service this morning about some of y'all. And that's as far as we're going on that one. (laughs) All right. So do you not know that what enters from the outside cannot defile, or Jesus, what does defile us? Verse 19, Jesus goes into some pretty good detail here. It does not enter his heart. I mean, you eat anything, you eat something and you don't wash your hands or you forget to wash the iron skillet, which again is debatable whether you should or not. He says that doesn't enter your heart. Whatever you eat is not going to enter the center of who you are. All right. What happens, verse 19, it doesn't enter the heart, it enters the stomach and is eliminated. And that is a very churched up version of what the King James, for example, I think says, goes through the vent, and you can figure that out. Very biological term. Thus purifying all foods. And and, and he goes on. What comes out of a man? Now, we know he's not talking about food. He just crossed that bridge. So remember, this is not about to get kooky. What comes out of a man? That defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, Proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. This is the word of the Lord. And it's all true. I've said a lot of things on the way to getting here that I don't need to say now. It's not that we're not susceptible to tradition. It's not that we don't have problems shirking tradition. We have some traditions around here that I just love. Paul spoke in 2 Thessalonians about keeping traditions that he delivered to the Thessalonian church. Traditions are not the issue. Traditions that replace God's word is the issue. And I hesitate to say this because I love having friends. We still have some traditions that keep us from God. 
They may not be religious at their core, but they're things that we've done for years that we just decide God's okay with because my family's okay with it. And we need to get back to the point where we really desire to know what God says about an issue. We really do believe this Bible, and we really do believe that the highest authority in the land is not the Pentagon or the White House or Raleigh or even our own seat of the county here. Our highest authority is what God says. Even if everyone else gives us a buy. Even if everyone else says nothing about it. Even if there are no awkward moments at the dinner table. Even if everyone seems to shrug when you seem to be falling into your tradition. A tradition can be seen as something that appears to be with a lot of value. It has a lot of value. And sometimes, not all the time, sometimes they take the place of God. In the case of this passage here, they took the place of God's commands. Never mind what God says. We've got a workaround. And so I have just a few things in closing to share with you. Here we go. We're no different. We are right in the middle of this passage. Not because we are busy struggling with whether or not to wash the pots and pans, but because you and I have a heart. The biggest concern this morning is not our stomach. It feels like it maybe, about now. But it's our heart. It's not what goes in, it's what comes out. This is not a slam on religion in this passage, and that's usually the way it happens. We love slamming religion. And, and, and it's, a lot like, it's a lot like coming out of the closet. It used to be maybe unpopular, but now you'll get a call from the White House if you tell everyone you're a homosexual. It doesn't take bravery anymore to tell anyone that. It's clapped. It's, a lo it's lauded. It's applauded. Anyone who does anything sinful or kooky, it will get you accolades from any administration any of the time because it makes the general population feel better. That's not the test. This is not a slam on tradition more than a tradition that replaces the Bible. What we have here is a list that Jesus gave us. Some of these things look very bad, murders, and other things look very tame, evil thoughts. Some of these things look deplorable and you would never want to see them in your home, like, I don't know, murder, and other things seem not so bad, like pride. And Jesus has them all in the list and says that they all defile our Selves. Why? Because they go into our stomach? No, but because they come out of our hearts. The problem is that the heart has always been the heart. And Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And I tell every couple that I end up conducting a ceremony for in that thing called marriage, and I say to them, listen, whenever you're in a battle with your future spouse, you need to realize that you're probably the most susceptible person in the relationship. But it ain't me. What if it's her? You should probably always suspect yourself first. But it ain't me. It's him. You should probably always suspect your own heart. It's deceitful above all things, desperately wicked and defiled. Not me. Not me. I know me. I'm a good person. The Lord does not let good people into heaven. He lets saved people into heaven. So if you've never been bad enough to go to hell, you'll never be good enough to go to heaven. That's frustrating. But here... The reason he's sharing these things with disciples is because in Mark 6, he says after the feeding of the 5,000, he finds them in a boat, and it says they were slow to believe on him because their what? Heart. Thank you. Their heart was what? Hardened. And then we look here in chapter 8 of Mark. Look in chapter 8. Look at verse 17. He has another feeding, and he says in verse 17, Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Brothers and sisters, the, the, the message of today's passage is not the hardness of the scribes and Pharisees' hearts. We expect them to have hard hearts. They're out-and-out out sinners. 
Jesus moves on and he talks to the crowd, the people that follow the biggest show in town. These will be the people that wander into the next church that has a new pastor. And then they'll wander to the next church that has a new pastor. These are the people Jesus calls to himself and this is the crowd. And we expect them to have kind of hard hearts because they're fickle. But the ones we're talking about today are the ones towards the end of our passage where Jesus eats with them all the time. They're in the house and he says, you really better be careful because you are susceptible right here in your heart not me yes yes you not me I'm a member here you not me I'm a guest here you me we're made out of the same stuff and this is exactly why we need grace oh we better be careful the biggest battle today is not from the outside y'all still with me Don't let me lose you. I know what time it is. No one knows about the time better than I do. It's not the economy that is your worst enemy. It will not defile you. It is not your job that will defile you. It is not your neighbors that will defile you. It is not a disease that will defile you. It is not communism that will defile us. It is not socialism that will defile us. It is not KKK or Black Lives Matters that defiles us. Yes. It is not, oh, I just offended some of y'all. Hold on, hang on, come on back, come on back. It is not the moderate right or the moderate left that defiles us. Is that better? It is not the far right or the, am I getting it covered here? There are no external threats in our lives today that defile us in the most obvious ways. We came in these doors thinking, the biggest deal going on for me right now is this relationship, that finance, this car, that house, those shingles, whatever it is. And God says, oh, no, 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 no. Let's get this fixed right now. The biggest risk to us is our own hearts. Not your heart, not your heart. The biggest risk to me is my own heart filthy heart but let's be fair let's be fair those who have been touched by grace eventually find some victory in their own hearts take a look as we're closing at mark chapter number 12 brothers and sisters before we get in our cars before we go to our jobs before we talk with people that that, this is one of the biggest needs for you and I to meet with God every morning. We get with God every morning. I've got to be working at 4.30, Pastor Bill. Get up five minutes earlier and pay attention to your heart. Before you go meet that doctor or confront that mechanic or whatever it is on your slate tomorrow, check the major threat in our lives, and that is what defiles us from within, our own hearts. Brothers and sisters, the list that Jesus gave us of what comes pouring out of our hearts should make you fear exceedingly. In our very hearts lies the potential for murder and adultery. In our hearts lies the potential for the sin that you never thought you'd be susceptible to. Yeah. Yeah. In our hearts, that sin that we think is so wicked we shouldn't even preach on it in church because surely nobody is guilty of it, we have the very seed of that wicked awfulness deep in here. Scripture says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, for him that thinks he stand, take heed, lest he fall. And so here, Mark 12, as we're closing, look at verse 30. Uh, Let's say verse 28. One of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceived that he had answered them well, asked them, which is the first commandment of all? Hey, this is a great question. This is much better than the questions Jesus has been getting. Y'all still with me? This is much better than the questions Jesus has been getting. This is a very good question. Jesus, what is the best commandment? What's the greatest commandment? Jesus, I'm a bottom line guy. What would you tell me to do if I could only do one thing? Good question. Verse 29, Jesus answered, 
The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your and your soul and your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. All right, listen, listen to the scribe's response and then listen to Jesus' response to the scribe's response. Here we go. Verse 32. The scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken truth. This is where we get one of our proof texts for saying amen when you hear something you like, all right? For there is one God. There is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart. I mean, it's the first on the list. I love it. With all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now listen to what Jesus says. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, look here, you're not far from the kingdom of God. He does not say, it's good to have you in the kingdom. He does not say, hey, just repeat these prayer after me and we'll seal the deal. He leaves the man hanging over hell with an understanding you're that close. Well then, what should we assume about this passage of scripture? We should assume, brothers and sisters, that when a person is a part of the kingdom, John 3, 3, except he may be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, Colossians 1, 12, he's translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. Y'all with me still? If you're saved, you're a part of the kingdom. This man wasn't far from the kingdom, and he had it right. You ought to love the Lord with all your heart. Listen, if this doesn't happen for you at all, you're, you're, you're close to the kingdom this morning, but you're not in it. Come back. Come on back, let me get your attention again. If you don't love God with your heart, you're that close to the kingdom, but you're not in it yet. But I thought all we had to do was get saved to go to heaven. Saved people, they get new hearts. And those new hearts, they love God. I don't really have much time for God. My wife's happy she got me here today that far from the kingdom. I don't like to come. My husband makes me come. He makes me feel bad if I don't want to get up and come. There's nothing inside you that loves God. You're close. Oh, you're so close this morning to the kingdom. But your heart is defiling you and keeping you outside of it. Now, think about, think about the gospel we share today. Think about the gospel we share today. The gospel that we share today in America wide, the gospel that we ask for in hospitals and at funeral homes and in graveside services, the gospel that we're looking for is a bare minimum. What do I have to do? Just tell me what I got to do to seal this thing so that I can be selfish the rest of my life and still wake up in heaven. That is the gospel that we as Americans have been hearing for 150 years we haven't heard a gospel of repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And think about the possibility, brothers and sisters, of think about the, oh my goodness, it's overwhelming. Okay, I'll tell you a story. Here's how overwhelming it's getting. I took a young preacher with me to the bookstore in Statesville uh, this Tuesday afternoon. He, he attends and goes to a particular church here in the area. I love the church. I love the pastors. I'm not going to tear anybody down. I, he teaches a Sunday school class. The Sunday school class has 13 or 14 young men in it. He teaches the young men every Sunday. He prepares every week to teach the young men in Sunday school every Sunday. That's, pretty good. That's a pretty good clue that you're supposed to be teaching or preaching is that you can't keep yourself from doing it. I tell young men all the time, if I can keep you from preaching, good. You shouldn't be doing it. And I said to him, tell me about the people in the class. He says, well, I just try to teach them they ought to find what God wants them to do and do it the way God wants it done. I said, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good line of thinking. The only problem is an unsaved man can teach that. A Jew can teach that. And lots of people do. We're New Testament believers. Tell me what that changes when you're a New Testament believer. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. 
How many, and I'm driving, so don't worry, I wasn't getting in his face doing these gestures. I'm driving and eating a hamburger or something like that, you know, something to keep myself on the road. Just a nice, light conversation, a hamburger and driving, right? And, and I say to him, I say, how many of those young men love God? And uh, he said, well, a few of them do. I said, a few of them. Let's just say that you're double right. Let's say that you've got a handful that means that you've got 10 or 9 that have no evidence that they love God. They think that the biggest defilement in their life right now is that they can't get the updated game console. They think the biggest problem in their life is that they can't find the class or the homeroom teacher that they wanted. They think the biggest problem in their life is that that little girl across the classroom don't like you. They think that's their biggest issue. They haven't come to face to face with the fact that the biggest problem is this blood pumping thing in here that is used and referred to when referring to the center of who we are, our hearts. The biggest defilement is our hearts. And we have a gospel in America, brothers and sisters. Hang with me. The preacher's almost done. I'm landing this thing. We have a problem where we have potentially 10 people from a single Sunday school class that will be in heaven and don't love God. Then you add up all the Sunday school classes in all the churches in all the countries of the world and you take those untold millions of non-God-loving people and shove them in heaven. If you think that scripture for one second allows for that scenario, your God is pretty small. We're not going to get to heaven and find out that there's a bunch of people there that don't love God. If there's nothing in the center of our being that beats for God this morning, you're that far from the kingdom. Imagine we have such a self-centered religion in America, brothers and sisters, where even we are the attention of even heaven. I swear to you, when we have a heaven that is filled with reunions with families and jokes, I might have been a part of a funeral or at least heard about a funeral from a previous coworker that happened a week and a half ago where so-and-so loved the guitar, so they're playing the guitar in heaven, and it's almost laughable. He loved matchbox cars. There must be matchbox cars in heaven. He liked a pony, so there must be a pony in heaven. He had a collie, so there must be collies in heaven. The reality is heaven is not about us. When we get to heaven, we won't be thinking, where's the basketball? We're going to be lovers of God, and if we're not now today being prepared for such a reality, don't expect something mystical to happen when the trumpet sounds. Can you imagine? <laughs> when Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration. Stop, pause. And there proclaim, where's mama? And there proclaim, where's that perfect set of legs I've been waiting on? Brothers and sisters, we have made heaven a therapeutic outline place somewhere in the skies where everything can be about me still. And that is why our marriages and our churches look the same as they do outside of our churches. Because our hearts are not hearts that have been crafted from heaven. That is why we act the same way on Facebook that other people do. Because our hearts are the old hearts that defile us. And we have the audacity to tell the God of heaven... I'm good. I prayed the prayer. Let's stand together. Kim, would you come to the piano?
Heads bowed, eyes closed, please. Brother Rick, would you come up here? Brother Randy, would you come and receive people who might need to pray? Lord, please, please touch the person that is nearest hell today. But by being in this building today under the sound of your preaching, they are not far from the kingdom. I pray that you'd help us to remember that not just heaven, but heaven on earth is about you and our new hearts that adore you. I'll never understand, Lord, how we have a culture of Christianity that has devolved to where heaven is nothing but a big hunting lodge and we can all go up there and be selfish just like we've been trying for 50 years and 60 years and 70 years down here. God, I pray that there'd be true blue salvation. I pray that you'd take people that know better for years and have no heart throb for God. I pray you'd help us to remember Romans 8, 15, that in our depth of hearts, the Holy Spirit cries, Abba, Father. If there is no affection for the Father, O oh Lord, I pray that you convince that sinner in here today that there is no heaven in their future either. Christians are praying, the music is playing. If God is troubling your heart, God is dealing with your soul. Guest or member alike, I wish that you would put your faith in the gospel and trust Christ Jesus as your Savior. We're not playing 27 stanzas of Just As I Am. We're not playing 15 verses of I Surrender All. The salvation that Christ offers is for whoever wills. But you will not be saved if you will continue to hope that life can be about you. Oh, what a system we have, Christians. What a system we have known, cognitive, not Christians. I can serve myself here, and then because Jesus paid it all, I can go to heaven and serve myself there. Oh, Lord, help us to be a God-centered people. Help us to have theology that lifts up the Word of God. Help us to have people that know what it is, that God is the center of our being. Oh, Lord, give us quaking hearts for heaven's reality. For if you're able to be the center of all things among thousands and ten thousands around the throne, why not here? Why not in your own house? If, if the heaven and the heavens of heavens cannot contain you, then will you blow out the seams of this building? Will you crush our hearts that are defiling us? For the Christian, oh God, who's struggling, they're truly saved. They have a heart for God, but they're misplacing the blame. I pray that they would suspect themselves. And I pray for this pastor that you've entrusted with this work, that you'd help me to remember my biggest concern in life is not people who disagree with me. It's my own heart that opposes God. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Not just people seeking salvation, but any who seeks to pray can make use of this altar. We'll wait a while, and if you come, we'll wait on you. No one's looking. You have all the privacy you need. If you'd like to kneel where you are, you may do that. If you'd like to sit where you are, you may do that. You follow God. here to pray with ladies if they need. We have other ladies up front. Brother Rick, Brother Randy here to pray with you if you need. Oh Lord, do your work.
As we close this service, I pray that you'd save that sinner nearest hell. And I pray for the rest of us who are sinners yet saints that you would help us, oh God, to remember what we've heard here today. May this be a great emancipation. May we be free of the burden of being slaves to sin. Grant us, oh God, for your great namesake, liberty in Christ. As a church, as families, as individuals, that all the earth may know that the God of heaven lives on earth in the vessels of clay, that he is redeemed in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I'd ask you to let our guests go first through this door over here. Brother Tim, where are you? Has he already left the building, headed over to the gym? Do you have any last announcements? All right. Again, there are several ways you can get to the gymnasium, a.k.a. Family Life Center. Through this door, down the stairs, through down the elevator. Through this door, down the stairs. Through this door, down the hallway, down the stairs, through the elevator. Out the front, around the back, so on and so forth. I hope you'll join us. I praise God for your year dismissed.